I was told before, this, since I have no microphone, that you will anyways hear me because of this very high-tech microphones that are hanging from the ceiling. But uh, anyways, if at any point you feel I'm talking not loud enough, maybe uh, instead of like you use, not, you use your hands to show me in, in some way, one or the other way. Um, so I will be talking about today why do we need hands in VR. And um, I'm co-founder and CTO of Polici, which is a Stockholm-based startup where we enable hand interactions between humans and computers and robots. But I'll not really talk about so much in detail. It's not like a sales pitch what, what we are doing today. Uh, I'm also probably not a good salesman as our CEO is. Uh, I will make more talk about uh, hands and VR. And uh, besides that, I'm co-founder and CTO of Ricci. I'm also founder of the VR, Stockholm VR Meetup, uh, which is, I think, nowadays with one, more than 1,300 members, one of the biggest in the, in the Nordics. And uh, that's I'm actually also how I, how I started with, the, um, with my journey through VR. Like five years ago, when uh, Pamelaki, created the Oculus and somehow started this kind of de democratization of VR. Uh, we are still not there yet that every end customer has a VR headset, but we are somehow getting there. So uh, at that point, as we can see here, you have a VR headset. I guess most of you really know nowadays what, what VR is about. But uh, already in one of the first TV spots where Palmer Lucky appeared, uh, which you can see down here, um, you see that people have expectations. Like, you, you are not only, you don't, first you are very amazed by the visual input that you get, by what you see and that you can actually, well at that point it was only looking around, it was not even walking around yet. So it had no kind of motion tracking, so people got quite quickly sick. They don't do that nowadays anymore. But uh, what you after five minutes or so have noticed is that people start to grab in the air, assuming that they can actually interact with things. So what Pamalaki already said at that point is, at some point you really want to see your hands or to be able to hold an object and actually move it around. So um, that's all about human expectations, what we actually want to do. And uh, why do we have, as humans have these kind of expectations? It's simply because we as humans use our hands on a daily basis to interact with our environments. Imagine you wouldn't have any hands. Um, or, I mean, some people actually have that as a serious, serious problem. Amputees, uh, stroke patients that cannot use their hands in a good way anymore. Or if you just accidentally cut your hand or, or finger in the kitchen. I mean, uh, you will be surprised how, effect, how that can affect your daily life. And there is a biological and also evolutionary reason for that. Um, imagine that your, your brain or cortex as a kind of map, of, as a world map, and uh, where every part of the body is like a country. And in large, like the, imagine a human figure, for example, where each body part, it has the same size relatively um, to how much your brain is actually working with that body part. It's a little bit complicated to maybe to, to visualize it, but I will give you a hint. It looks like this. That is called the sensory homunculus and describes how we as humans perceive the world or how our brains perceive the world. So, for example, I don't know if this uh, pointer here is really small, but I mean, one thing that you directly see is that the hands are really big on this uh, homunculus, which means hands and the senses we have now on our hands, touching, for example. Haptics is very important for us as humans in our daily life. There is a counterpart of the sensory homunculus, which is called the motor homunculus, which is not like how we perceive the world, what some kind of sensor inputs we get in, 
but how we actually interact with the environment. So that's the motor homunculus, like all the, the, the joints that we have in our fingers, or our legs, or even uh, the, the tongue here. And we obviously have some complicated muscles also in, in the eyes here that enlarge them. What I want to say in mostly is that you can see that hands are important for humans also from a biologically and evolutionary uh, standpoint. And that means that we as humans ha have these expectations when we want to represent a virtual environment like our real world environment, that we have the expectations that we can also use our hands as a major component of feeling and touching and interacting with the virtual environment. Uh, because in a virtual environment like this, I mean, when you when you are playing computer games or not, uh, you can imagine when you, when you get in a scene like this, what what are your expectations? You want to open this little chest over there, or you want to interact with this uh, wheel here to open the safe. You want to let, maybe touch that little squirrel that's sitting over there, or um, do anything else as you are used to in real life. Um, and that's why, especially also in, in VR, people have started very early thinking about why do you, or how do you get these hands that are so important for us into a virtual environment. Um, which comes back to the question of the homunculus. When you put some VR glasses on it, or some VR environment, you need to create the hardware that is either interacting with humans, or that is also proceeding from the humans, what it's doing. For example, I mean, on, on this left side, obviously, VR is a display. You have to create the hardware that displays or fools the human eyes um, to be in this virtual environment. And maybe as an example for the right side, you maybe want to have some kind of haptic gloves or haptic feedback um, for your hands so that VR um, can also um, produce these like, kind of signals and you can, you can uh, touch different things. Obviously, I mean, when you want to reproduce everything, every single sense, uh, you at some point end up to be somewhere here uh, that you really represent, like, I mean, you, you have like ear earphones and a headset and you Simulate the wind, and you simulate that you are flying on a plane. Um, that's not really the idea here, and I, I want to um, also emphasize again that hands are, as we see from the biology point of view, one of the most important things. So let's get back to hands. 2013, that was around the same time, I think just one or two months later than this, um, than uh, the, the video with. Uh, the video clip with um, Palmer Lucky in the beginning that I showed to you, people already said, okay, virtual rea reality gaming is nearly here. The only thing we just left with is the right controller. So what's the right controller, people asked. And people start to build uh, hardware. They build controllers that are very similar to game controllers. Uh, like the Oculus Touch here or the HTC Vive, with com which come with the most recent headsets. People have built uh, 3D cameras that try to capture your finger movements, like the, the finger or lip motion or inter wheel sense over there. People have uh, created motion tracking data gloves for specifically for VR, some with uh, simple haptic uh, sensors like the Glove 1 over here. Uh, others with exoskeletons that actually cool your fingers in the right place, like the, like the sensor glove. So there are a lot of different options, but there are mainly three different classes that we see nowadays. One are the controllers, one is the 3D sensors, and one are the gloves. Um, and with 3D sensors and gloves, you have finger tracking. For example, that's an example uh, why they are good. Controllers like the Oculus Touch don't really have it. Uh, there will be a new device out there which is called SteamVR Knuckles that has 
still a little bit unclear, but some kind of finger tracking. Um, but going on gloss and controllers, obviously you have the, the, the advantage that you have feedback. You have something, in the controller's case, you have something in your hand, like, like this, and you have some kind of vibration, which is often already very powerful to fool your brain that something is, you're pulling, you're pulling something or you're grabbing something. And in the glass case also, I mean, whether it's some exoskeleton or whether it's some uh, uh, haptic feedback on it, you have the same option, but you don't have that in 3D sensors, obviously. When you have a 3D camera looking at you, you can do freehand movements, but there's nothing that really uh, gives haptic feedback to your hands. And the last two are comfortable. Um, so, Getting back to that and this kind of classification, what has happened over, I, I showed you a slide of some of the examples um, before. Um, how does the market look like now when you look at this? Did we find the right motion controller for VR? Um, there are these kind of controllers. Uh, you don't need to read, to go, I think, to, to go any of them, but there are a couple of 3D sensors. And there's quite a bunch of gloss out there that you can currently theoretically use for, for VR. Some of them are actually not out, some of them are in uh, prototype stage, but I mean, it's a lot of things that is happening on the market, but mainly from a hardware point of view. So how, did, how, far, did we get, how far did we get on the hand interaction side? Uh, now, this is an example with a Vive controller, you can see down there, I mean, those of you who have been in the, in the castle, yeah, I think uh, have uh, two setups, and I think both of them are using the Vive, so you might recognize it from, from there. And you see hand interaction, yes, you have a hand, but as soon as you actually interact with something, um, the hand disappears. And that's what uh, Job Simulator Alchemy Labs, who created this in, uh, instrument, are calling tomato presents because they, are called, they were grasping tomatoes and tomatoes were flying in the air. Um, so this is obviously not something very natural, not very uh, realistic and immersive. Um, let's see, to the next one. This is an example of lead motion for the 3D camera. Uh, where you can see you have a hand, it's tracked, even the fingers are tracked in a more or less robust way, but obviously since you grasp in the air, uh, you also have penetrating uh, the objects. And the last thing, uh, last demo, is uh, a very new glove, haptics glove, as you can see up there, it's kind of an exoskeleton that's actually affecting like how your fingers can move, and takes that information from, from this game that you see there. But I don't know if you noticed uh, before, it's still quite clumsy. I mean, not only the hardware, but also the actual interaction. When you try to grasp that ant or spider or whatever it is, you have to be really like uh, careful there and control your fingers uh, with a lot of energy to actually pick it up in the right way. So, the question that I always ask also before is like, is it good actually to look for the right controller, for, to take it from the hardware side, or is it more rather, I mean, would it be like, there will be no golden standard of controllers. Uh, that's, I think, what, what we should see. I mean, in which kind of use case are you going to use which controllers? We are working not only in gaming, but VR industry training and also stroke rehabilitation. And uh, I mean, in VR stroke, or stroke rehabilitation in general, you can't put a heavy controller into a stroke patient's hand. Uh, you can't even sometimes assume that the people can put gloves on themselves. So for example, there is a 3D camera. It might be your choice. In other examples, industry training, uh, where a lot of people are still new to VR, maybe you want something very simple, something like a controller where you have one button on it and you just interact, you just do things uh, automatically. So um, 
From this slide, I want to move a little bit more from the kind of uh, controller tech technology part to the industry part, uh, which maybe I think uh, a couple of you are also interested in. I don't know who, how many of you are in, in a company that, or, uh, that is applying VR in the industry segment already now. Not, not so many. Um, and this is from 2017. A slide, uh, a study that was asking like, which technologies, actually the, the question is a little bit formulated wrong here according to the data. So what this says is which technologies are investing in VR in 2017. And as you can see here, like automotive, automotive, retail, consumer, healthcare, technology in 2017 uh, have invested by around 10% into VR, looking into it. Uh, but what's more interesting here is the comparison between today and in three years. You can see that people are, in 2017, assuming or really they are planning for putting VR into their industries for whatever kind of, for whatever kind, of um, kind of purpose. And some of the top purposes are dig digital culture, culture development, product service, uh, uh, modern innovation. One of the, the startups that is demoing over there in the castle, I, I think I, I heard the pitch. Uh, they are also doing, like, as far as I understood, uh, productification in VR. And uh, that's the thing that these companies are also looking at, um, and customer experience, obviously. These are one of some of the bigger ones, uh, sectors, these are some of the smaller ones. Um, one year earlier, uh, I will skip that one, uh, there was another study, so this was one year earlier, that particularly focused on virtual reality in industry and man manufacturing. And uh, you don't need to read uh, if you don't want to, all the stuff. But I want you, what, you, what I want you to put attention on is mainly two different things. That what they see there is 39% of the companies um, use or want to use the ability for employees to train in simulated environments. It's for safety training or training on machines that don't exist except for, for a sketchboard. Uh, for example, so this is a very, I think this is a very important and major aspect how virtual reality is going to change industry and manufacturing in the future. And while you can see that here maturity in 2016 was still very low, uh, and I didn't find any new information, but I think it should be now probably at least on the, on the three uh, level. I mean, all the headsets are out there, and while it still might be a bit expensive for the end consumers to just buy them and play, uh, for industries, that's, that's, not the, that's not the question. Uh, if they can buy a headset and a laptop, the already laptop uh, or desktop for maybe 2,000 euro, and they can save millions in terms of injuries or whatever, uh, they, they, will, they will do it. So in terms of VR and education, uh, these are some statistics from another source. You can say that hands-on training is much more effective than when you just read a video, or, um, look, at, look at the video or read a paper manual. Also, it's like reducing what I just mentioned, the injury frequency rate in your companies. I mean, uh, because you have better training. And really almost everyone, at least according to this study, prefers VR compared to other um, teaching methods. So, and what we can see there, I think, is kind of a, a summary that a major contributing factor is the immersion and involvement and control that trainees experience in VR. So you feel like you are there, you feel like you can do things as you are, as you are used to, you don't have any kind of um, Push anybody pushing you to read that manual, you can take it on your own pace and you will uh, be able to learn much easier and much more efficient than uh, regular training methods. 
And this is this study is only about VR and education, which means that there's no hands involved in particular in this study. But uh, immersion, involvement, and control particularly come from natural and realistic hand interaction. And uh, how you can see that is also there has been a, a comparison. What happens when you Dependent on how you represent your hands in virtual environments and how, to what degree actually you, you are immersing yourself in the virtual world. And how they do that is to compare immersion to the, to the pain you feel. So I'm not, I can't exactly remember uh, what they did. Maybe they had a virtual hand and they suddenly like cut it off or pinched it uh, in the virtual environment. And what you see here is like when you have a very realistic hand, you actually feel a lot of the pain yourself as a human. If you have a, like just a, a wooden block as your hand, you don't feel that. So your hands are an important factor to immerse yourself into the virtual environment. And that's also why it makes sense to um, use your hands, particularly in VR industry training, because when you have hands-on manufacturing training, you want to see your hands doing different things as you, as you are used to. Uh, one thing that I'm uh, probably not going into much detail is like, another thing that we are also looking into in is like that, uh, the second part on the slide that you saw before is employee-to-employee -employee communication. I mean, which in this case, I think they mean more like, okay, there are maybe avatars that interact with you, that tell you something, or uh, that employees also remotely talk to each other. But we shouldn't forget that actually hands are an important part of our communication. Uh, when I was like uh, waiting there to come in, there's a screen in the back room, and I was looking what people were doing here on the stage. And I obviously couldn't hear them, but I saw they are gesticulating, pointing over there, and that's also something that is very, uh, I mean, it's part of the communication, and the nice thing is also, it, it doesn't really, when you compare it to language, you have to know the language in order to understand. When you have a training program, you have to maybe present it in five languages, you have to make five different voiceovers, while when you instruct something with hands, pointing and showing how you're doing things, you don't need that. And it's very simple communication, uh, a way of communication. So, uh, to conclude in some way this presentation, why do we need how our hands in VR? I try to make clear that it's all about the expectations that we have in humans and how it affects us and how we should, uh, in, in my view, uh, create VR experiences. Um, so this is an example of what, what we are doing where we try to also go into like as an example what, what you expect. You have a big paper manufacturing machine that your, your employees are supposed to train in. You expect fully freehand interaction, not like some sticks flying around or just the, the tape. You want to see your hands and, and feel it. You want to grasp a knife and cut the paper. You even can do more than what you would do in the virtual world. In the, in the real world, like overlaying the virtual environment with interfaces that help you in training, like uh, showing you what to do next, giving you feedback about uh, what you did wrong, what you did right, and then um, like doing everything with that machine that you should be able to do in, in the real environment. So, um, that concludes uh, my talk, and um, if you have any kind of um, questions, not particular about, well, either about the company, uh, about what we are actually doing uh, in the company, or if you have questions about VR, or if you actually maybe are from Stockholm or the surrounding and want to present at one of our VR meetups, uh, just either come by just after the talk or um, send us send me an email. Thank you.
actually, now that, you, that now that you're talking about it, I'm thinking about when I, uh, we are using augmented reality. Mm -hmm. And it immediately became easier to understand uh, because I could actually see my hand then. Mm -hmm. yes. But then you can't really simulate a virtual reality. Then you have the reality there, maybe there's a prototype and you can build things on it. And that's actually what we are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so this is really interesting. The next step. Uh, we have time for one question here. Yes? It was actually about this. You know Kinect, the Microsoft product, it's a disband, but it still works. Can't you use that combined with the virtual reality interface? Um, we are using that also for a, um, a stroke rehabilitation project. The thing there is that the Kinect is quite good in full body tracking, so you can track your, your limbs. Um, on the finger tracking level, it's it's not that good because I think it has only like two or three points on on the hands that it's um, uh, that it's tracking. Maybe the thumb and something like something uh, in, in the middle of the fingertips and some wrist point. So you can't really track fine finger uh, motion. So that's why in this case we are complementing it with a leap motion, for example. That is. And actually go into more details about the finger tracking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.